Well, this morning I want to start by reading for us our JBC value statement on Christian community. This is one of our six value statements. You see it right down here, Christian community. Uh, these value statements are things that we as a church value and thus practice. So when people say, what are they about? What do they value? You do what you value. This is one of the things we strive to do. We are committed to one another as God's family. To grow in authentic biblical community. We are a covenant community cultivating love, unity, and fellowship in our Sunday, weekly, and life group gatherings. And I wish I'd have made an overhead of that one, but you see, we, I said we, we are committed to this. We are committed to one another. We are committed to individuals, as it says, God's family, individuals who make up God's family, and we are committed to individuals who make up God's family, it says, to grow in authentic biblical community. We want to see our lives flourishing under the Lordship of Christ and exhibiting the love of the Savior and doing the things that God has called us to do as His covenant people. And so this morning we are going to be looking at uh, the topic, I'm just kind of loosely calling this healthy biblical friendships or Christian community, more precisely, of our need to make certain that we have uh, that we have and that we foster and that we cherish and that we maintain friendships with people who love the Lord. With people who share our interest in living in a way that is in a manner worthy of our calling. And this is why a biblical Christian community is not just a good idea, but it's an essential aspect of our lives. We oftentimes fail to realize just how desperately we need the body of Christ the church. In the culture in which we live today, people, it's like a ping pong match. You go, we kind of go from one church to the next church to the next church to the next church, depending on if the youth group is offering something cooler than the other group, etc., etc. I could go on, but we really need the church so that we can be committed to people, to being committed to authentic accountability and growth in Christ's likeness. Amen? We need this. Have you ever noticed the strong connection between your friends and your hobbies? What are your hobbies? That, that hobby has a collection of friends, doesn't it? Your friends and your interests, your friends and your outlook on life. Have you ever noticed the strong connection between your friends and your values that you live by? or your friends and the choices you make in life, or your friends and your walk with Christ? Have you ever just paid attention to the strong connection that there is between people who become BFFs and who walk together in life? This connection between our friends and who we become in life is extremely Strong, And we need to be wise enough to realize that if we want to be numbered among those who have a worthy walk, a worthy walk that's according to the gospel of Christ, we must choose friends who also have that same desire. And this is why it's imperative that we walk through life with other believers who share our hobbies, our interests, our outlook on life, our values by which we live, and the life choices that we ultimately will be making. I love the Genesis 4-9 principle, that of being our brother's keeper or guardian. In Genesis 4-9 it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And again, I love this question of the Lord's of where is Abel your brother because it gives the input, the clear indication that Cain was to know the whereabouts of his brother. Now, this was his brother by flesh, but we are brothers and sisters even at a level closer than that of flesh, which is perishing. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, which is eternal. I love Matthew Henry's commentary on this verse. 
He said, a charitable concern for our brethren as their keepers is a great duty which is strictly required of us, but is generally neglected by us. Those who are unconcerned in the affairs of their brethren and take no care when they have opportunity to prevent their hurt in their bodies, goods, or good name, especially in their souls, do, in effect, speak Cain's language. I do not know how my brothers or sisters are doing or their whereabouts. So this morning, as we work through some biblical wisdom relative to human relationships, let's do this with an eye to evaluating our choice of relationships with those brothers and sisters of ours who are in our family, the family of God. And let's be mindful of the fact that we are indeed our brothers and sisters' keeper. Another good verse is Galatians 6, verses 1 through 2. It demonstrates this very plainly. Paul writes, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So he's talking about brothers, brethren here in verse 1. And verse 1 of chapter 6, he's talking about brothers and sisters, those who would be claiming to be in the family of God. If anyone is caught in a trespass, so if any of your brethren or sisters, brothers or sisters in Christ, are caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, and perhaps you're spiritual on that particular day or occasion, and you might be the one, on the, the shoe may be on the other foot at some point in your life, you who are spiritual, it says, restore such a one, in a spirit of gentleness. So the very fact that we are to be about this business right here of restoring such a one in a spirit of gentleness indicates that clearly there are to be intimate relationships amongst the family of God whereby we know each other's lives enough to know that one has even fallen into a trespass. But we live so distant in our lives these days because it's to even admit that we might be sinful to another brother or sister in Christ, and our estimation is to confess a weakness. And so we refrain from doing said reality, and we walk in our own little world of darkness, and we hide. We clearly have the responsibility in one another's lives. We are our brother and sister's Keeper, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. In other words, when you observe this brother or sister and you're restoring such a one in your spirit of gentleness, be mindful of the the suffering or the difficulty or the hardship that they're going through so that that will remind you as to why you don't want to fall into that same trap of temptation and sin. Because the same misery that befell their life from which they need restoration and help in will befall you if you do the the same things. So it's a a relationship of sharing one to another. So verse 2, the very familiar passage. Thus bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is the law of love. And this is how we love each other as a body. This is how we love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we are each other's keeper, guardian. We're actually to be friends with one another. Outside of a meeting like this. And that's why we promote small groups and life groups. So that we can, because it's hard to spend enough quality time in such a truncated portion of our Sundays where we're passing by each other and we've come to do a particular thing which is to worship Jesus. This is why small groups are essential for relationships with people who share your values, your interests. The same kind of decisions that you're desiring to make in life, you find them in these kinds of places. And so we need to make sure we're trafficking in those areas, in those places purposefully, so that we can be those who are effectively fulfilling the law of Christ in each other's Lives Not to do so would be living in contradiction to the Word of God. It might be that we think that we can find a better way to maybe fulfill the law of Christ 
rather than through having such intimate relationships with the people of God's family. It just doesn't work that way. We just, it doesn't. So we keep things very simple, and this is the way we are to live. Amen? We must take care of one another. We need to be in each other's lives. We need to be careful with whom we become close friends. Because, number one, the loyalty to a fool will cost you greatly. Choose your friends wisely. Loyalty to a fool. And when I say fool here, I'm not talking about somebody who just spouts off stupid stuff. It's a fool is one who says there is no God. It's a fool who says that they can kind of figure out how to make life work apart from the from the scriptures, right? Like God has revealed truth, like here's biblical wisdom. A fool's like, hey, God and I have got this kind of thing worked out. Don't mess, don't bother me with the details. God and I are good. That person is foolish because they think that they can outsmart God or they've come up with an arrangement with God that God didn't actually enter into. He entered into a unilateral covenant by himself in Genesis chapter 17 where he swore by himself. That's why it's a unilateral covenant, like a unicycle has how many wills? Oh, one will, not a bicycle, but a unicycle. So it's not a bilateral, it's a unilateral, not a bilateral covenant that God entered into. It was a one-way covenant. God swore by himself he was going to do something, and that's what he does. He's not looking for your uh, uh, arrangements. He's looking for your submission. So a fool is somebody who could be a very intelligent person and even uses Scripture and talks around the edges of Scripture and kind of weaves Scripture in this way or that way. And it always seems to have a semblance of Scripture woven into it. But when push comes to shove, they're not individuals who are causing you to grow in Christ-likeness. You always seem to be at a place where things are kind of hurting a little bit more than helpful. And so the passage that I want you to look at this morning is in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I've got it on the overhead for you. And notice the first words that Paul uses here with regard to this concept, this, this idea, is to not be deceived. Because even, I, I just have this feeling that even in, my, in the things that I have spoken thus far this morning, perhaps I've stepped on some toes, and in your mind you're already doing mental gymnastics as to how you are justifying certain relationships and the depth of those relationships with individuals who aren't going to be beneficial to you spiritually, but they're a lot of fun. And sometimes these Christians over here, they're just not as much fun. You know, they like to eat chips and Doritos and drink Diet Coke and, and, and do silly card games. That's, that's not as much fun, but this is really fun. Yeah, but is this going to cause you to grow in Christ-likeness? Is this going to help you be an individual who can bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ? Are those relationships going to be those that cause you to seek more of the Lord? After all, you're here but for a moment, and it's over and it's gone. So we just want to be those who have the sensitivity to the Word of God and the Spirit of God that inspired the words of God and to have our hearts tuned to the Scriptures. Amen? So don't clock me off yet. Notice, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. There's a lot of people these days that seem to be deceived into not believing this very basic principle. And Paul is here warning the church in Corinth, as well as any church or any Christian that would be reading 1 Corinthians 15, as we are here this morning, that bad company will corrupt your good morals, your desire to live in a way before God that is in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bad company will lead to harm in your life. It's not going to lead to good. It's going to, it's going to corrupt that which is good in you. Paul's saying in as plain language as he can say that there are individuals who will even work their way into your church, and by context, by the way, just in the context of this, Paul is talking about individuals who have weaseled, if you will, their way into the church, 
And the bad company that he's referring to are individuals who have bad doctrine. And bad doctrine is that in this context that is leading to these believers to make bad decisions in life and it will corrupt their good morals. Kind of that antinomian approach that should, you know, should sin abound, that grace may abound all the more. There were some who were saying, absolutely, bad doctrine comes with bad company and it will corrupt your good morals. In verse 33, notice, for, I mean, 34, notice, he, he goes on and he, and he adds, I've got it on the screen here, he says, listen, become sober-minded as you ought. And notice the connection that he's making here with the corruption of your bad morals, that, that, that bad company will corrupt your, your good morals. Notice the connection, he says, be sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. The direct application, the, the corruption of the good morals is leading directly to a life of sinning. And he's saying, stop that. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And those individuals who have no knowledge of God is connected with bad company. Those who are bringing a gospel contrary to that which Paul had already delivered to you. Now, in our context, bad company could be a, a lot of individuals, and we're going to get to some passages that talk about that as unbelievers are also bad company. But even in the context, and these would be unbelievers, by the way, but these are unbelievers that look like sheep in wolves' clothing. They look just like you. They speak a lot like you. They use the Scriptures, and they even affirm Scriptures a lot like you. But their doctrine, being false doctrine, it corrupts that which is good in you. And it leads and it turns the grace of God on its head. And so he's saying, stop listening to these people and stop your sinning. He says, I speak this to your shame. I mean, imagine if the Apostle Paul was the founding pastor of this church and he leaves and no sooner he leaves and people come in and start preaching a gospel contrary to that and, and we start following in that. He says, this, that, that's to your shame. The truth was brought to you. Stop it. Bad company corrupts good morals. And in a proverb that kind of affirms this is Proverbs 13.20. It says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer what? You say it. Will suffer harm. You see the word will? It doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say might. It says will. If you make close friends with fools, and here's the idea of fools again, individuals who are not desiring to walk in accordance with God's Word, they're not, willing, they're not desiring to be those who are fulfilling the law of Christ, they're not their, quote, brother's keepers, they're out here just trying to live life on their own apart from the body of Christ, apart from the church, it's going to ultimately, it will lead to the suffering of harm. Decisions that you end up later regretting. Pain that comes as a result of said decisions. So I think the old proverb says, and I maybe have used it over the last couple of weeks, but if you, if you run with dogs, you're going to get fleas, right? You've heard that one before. But if you walk with wise men, you will be wise. And where do you walk with wise men? Where do you, ladies, where do you walk with wise women? Where do you do this? Walking is the idea of living life. Where, how do we do this? There's not a lot of contexts in our lives in which we can actually do this. And so we have to be those who purposefully create avenues. We call them small groups, life groups. There's a lot of names that they can be called, but it's God's family gathering together to do life on life, to build relation, knowledgeable relationships with each other so that we can help each other. I mean, help each other. We're not there to be each other's judge and jury. It said if somebody falls into a transgression, it says those of you who are spiritual are to do what? Gently restore them. We're not beating them over the head with the Bible. It's the last thing in the world we want to do. We have compassion and we have an understanding of God's mercy and grace and its application to brothers and sisters. But we have to move ourselves into a context where we can be walking with people who have our own our interests, values, desires which our desire should be that of Christ's likeness. Amen? That's what we should and must be doing. Because if we don't, we will suffer harm. It's just a matter of time, not a matter of if and when.
So first, loyalty to a fool will always harm you. And rather than give a a myriad of examples of this, um, I think that you've probably lived enough life yourself that you've probably had some loyalty sometimes to foolish people, people who do not love the Lord and do not have the values and principles that the Scriptures, and you probably have walked enough in life where you've probably tasted a little bit of that harmful effect that their lives can can add to you and cause you to maybe weaken your stance with your, in your relationship with God or enable or cause you or, or tempt you or encourage you to do some things that you might not otherwise want to do, number one. Number two, loyalty to wise will lead to blessing. These are very simple principles, aren't they? Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen: iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. In the Talmud, this applied uh, to students sharpening each other in the study and the memorization of the Torah. It's the idea that constructive criticism and accountability between brothers and sisters in Christ will develop godly character as together they seek to live lives that are pleasing to God. Iron sharpening iron. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus said it this way, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Iron sharpening iron. And as a result of having an intimate relationship with Christ, our lives should be that which is sharpening. It's giving an advantage to our brothers and sisters. It's enabling them to make wiser decisions and wiser choices, to see the options more clearly, to even learn from some of our past mistakes. Some of you entering into parenting, it's always fascinating to me that people who have children of the same age ask each other, well, what, what do you do and what do you do? I always went to people who had already raised their kids and, tell, and I said, tell me what you did wrong. <laughs> they've been there, they've done that, they've learned the hard way, right? This is how you sharpen one another with iron. And a personal illustration, I can tell you that I am... I personally am who I am today as a result of the closest friendships that I have chosen to make in my life. And the first was with a girl that I chose to marry. She has consistently now for 28 years of marriage and 32 years of being my best friend consistently sharpened me in my walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. Best decision I ever made. Because the principle of iron sharpening iron so one person can sharpen another is absolutely true. So make certain you're, cho- you're choosing your BFFs well with individuals who will consistently, through their life and love of God, Say hard things to you. You know, when iron crosses each other, you see the friction and sparks fly, right? Maybe my wife and I have had a few sparks fly over the years of 28 marriage, just once. Okay, twice. But sparks flying isn't necessarily a bad thing if the end goal and it's pushing us to Christ's likeness, to more conformity with the principles and patterns and the movements we see in the Scriptures, Right? Choose your friends wisely, I'm just telling you. And if you're single and you've yet to get married, you might want to give due consideration. I use my wife in this illustration. Listen, sometimes husbands and wives have to start this in the middle of marriage, and you just have to hit, re- you have to hit the reset button. And you have to say, we're going to reset, and we're going to commit our ways to the Lord. His word will be a standard. It will be the only authority over us in our household. Might's not going to make right. God's word's going to make right. And so in our relationship, moving forward from this day, moving forward, husbands and wives say to each other, God's word will be the standard by which we sharpen one another. And then you just practice it, getting better at that, because there's many opportunities through the course of your lives to be sharpening one another with respect to your walk with Christ. Let me give you an example of what this kind of looks like with some people you know or have read about. 
Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, 17 through 18. Listen to this. It says, Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter. And you can go and read the context more, but check this out. So that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Listen, Daniel had friends with whom he could do what? Pray. Daniel had friends with whom he could go to and pray to God for wisdom. It's that simple. And check this out. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these three friends of his, these were young, these were young people. These were young men that already had friendships with one another enough to where when things were going bad, things were going south, we need to get on our knees and pray to the only God in heaven who can resolve issues. They had friends with which they could get together and just pray. So let me ask you, do you? Do you? Could you get on the phone and call up one of your brothers and sisters in Christ in this local church and say, man, I've got some bad things that are going right now. I just need you to pray with me. Can we, can we get together and pray? Can we pray over the phone? My heart's burdened for some issues. And we cultivate that in biblical community. We cultivate those kinds of relationships in biblical community because we, are, we share things in common. I'll show you that here in just a second. So who are your friends? Who are you cultivating that your walk with Christ can be sharpened with their walk with Christ so that when crises even come into your lives or things over which you can rejoice, you can go to those friends and you can pray and you can say the hallelujah. You can enjoy God together. Do you have those kinds of friends? Loyalty to wise will lead to blessing. It's just a biblical principle. It's true. So do it. And thirdly, God's standard for healthy relationships. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, all the way through chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to hit you with a color change here on the screen, so don't let that surprise you. It was, a, it was a bit longer, so I needed to lose this part right up here. I needed that space, so I found another one that I could use. But listen to this. This is about as plain spoken as it can be. You ready? Check this out. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So this word right here in the New American Standard, bound together... In the King James and New King James, it says unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In the RSV, it's mismated with unbelievers. The ESV is unequally yoked with unbelievers. The Christian Standard Bible is mismatched with unbelievers. And the New Living Translation says, this is a little bit longer, team up with those who are unbelievers. So it's making it extremely clear that whether it's bound or unequally yoked or mismatched or we're not to team up with unbelievers. And then Paul goes on with the big why. Why? Why is that, why is that so? For, and notice, what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Partnership is from a Greek word that's, that's the idea of having a, re, a relationship involved um, sharing purposes and activities. When I think of a relationship that involves the sharing of purposes and activities, I think of child rearing, one in particular. We could expand that out to others, but that's one in particular that I think of. So we're not to be unequally yoked. We're not to be bound together in marriage and in other kinds of relationships with unbelievers because what partnership... The sharing of purposes and activities towards a common goal have righteousness and lawlessness. Righteousness is the act of doing what God would require, of, of doing what God deemed as being right. Lawlessness, by contrast, is obviously living contrary to what God requires and what God, through His Word, has deemed as being right. He's making a very stark comparison. This is why, this is why, for, that, 
this kind of being bound together or yoked together or partnered together with unbelievers shouldn't be happening. This is why we shouldn't be seeking to make best friends with unbelievers and bounding ourselves with them in life-term friendships that are going to lead us where? It's just cool, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. A companion of fools, the Scripture says, is going to suffer harm eventually. And what almost always happens, 99.9% of the time, and I give it that one point there, because everybody, there's always, everybody always knows the one exception to the rule. You've ever noticed that when you get in these conversations? They're like, well, yeah, but did you know? And there's like this exception to the rule, to the norm, of the way life normally functions and goes. When you get into a relationship with an unbeliever, are they pulling you down or are you pulling them up? Everybody knows in that context, it's the believer whose good morals get corrupt. And you get pulled down. And you find yourself like that frog in the kettle and you start compromising. And you start compromising in this area. Next thing you know, it compromises in a larger area. And the next thing you know, you know, like Proverbs 1, you're sitting, walking, standing with, right? We ha- Listen, this is, why, this is why biblical community, this is why the church is so important. And this is why we need to be those who purpose to seek friendship within the church of Jesus Christ. Now, you may say to yourself, yeah, but in that church, there's a lot of weird people. They're just not like me. They're different than me. Well, yeah, because I'm in it. And I'm like really weird compared to you. And you're probably weird compared to me. And we might have some different interests with regard to our hobbies. But do you know what our koinonia, our fellowship is truly in? It's in Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await the Savior. We saw that in last week's message, right? We're living for something that is far greater and beyond the scope of just time and the simple life that we have here on planet Earth. And so I learned to learn to love the things that make you peculiar and vice versa. Listen, my good friend Alex isn't here this morning. Alex Cutsinger. He and I are like, couldn't be more opposite in so many ways. In so many ways. But I have grown to love that young man with a true love and a heart of, of just love. We have so much, the more we spend time together, we have so much more in common. And the things that we have in common are the things that we end up talking about, laughing about, and enjoying fellowship around. I mean, I'm like 6'5", played sports. He's 5'6", and didn't. I mean, we're like completely opposites in, in a lot of ways. He's a genius. I'm just the average guy, man. I just studied hard and prayed and got through college. This guy's got two degrees in higher mathematics and stuff. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's... <laughs> Trust me, we, but the things that pull us together are the things that cause us to love each other. And I stay in touch with his life. He stays in touch with ours. When he's not in town on Sundays, I'm texting him, hey, what's up? We're friends. You build friendships with people. You live life together. Right? Because, and I'm going to read this a little bit faster now. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Again, light being people in the Lord and darkness being people who aren't? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? And Belial is just another name for Satan. Is there, is there harmony between Christ and Satan? I don't think so. Or what has a believer, getting more specific, in common with an unbeliever? What do we have in common? Our interests, when we got saved, did your interests change when you got saved? My interests were radically changed. They were, my interests were actually the things that I repented of because they were sinful against the holy God. Those were the things I pursued vehemently and had a fistful of dollars and thought I was enjoying life to its full. And then when God convicted my heart of sin and I saw who I was in relationship to His holiness... I cried out to God and I repented of those things. And God gave me a new heart. And you know what He did? He changed my affections. I no longer desired to do those things, that lifestyle, and all the friends that I had accumulated in that lifestyle. As a matter of fact, when I got saved, I sat down for two nights in a row with about 25 of my closest friends that I went through elementary, junior high, and high school with. And we sat in this circle in this room where we normally did other things and just sit and talk. Okay, every single night of the week we did these things. And I sat there for two nights in a row and I told them that God has changed my heart and faith in 
Baptist and I can no longer do these things. So I'm leaving this. I'm leaving this context. You won't see me back here again. Just know I love you, but you won't see me back here running in these circles with you because the things that I'm doing in these circles, I no longer have an interest in doing. My interests have changed. Praise God. And I literally haven't really ever seen them again since then. And these were people that I grew up with and loved deeply and had great relationships with. Still love them. I just love them differently now. Because what this isn't talking about, this isn't saying that believers aren't to have friendship evangelism relationships with people. It's not what that's talking about. As a matter of fact, if that's what it was talking about, then it completely destroys the whole notion of the Scriptures that says that believers are to have beautiful feet and go out into the world with the good news of the gospel and to preach it to all people who need to be saved, unbelievers. So it's not talking... This isn't a killjoy for friendship evangelism. This is maybe a killjoy for believers whose closest friends and most intimate friends are those who are not walking with Jesus and are leading them down paths that aren't good for them. They're not being a brother's keeper with one another. They're not thus fulfilling the law of Christ in each other's life. They're not bearing each other's burdens and helping each other grow in Christ's likeness. You following me? Are you? Give me a little head nod like I'm with you. Okay. So, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Temple of God, now notice it says over here, for we are the temple of God. So the temple of God is talking about true believers. Idols would be talking about false religion and non-believers. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is what God does through the new covenant of Jesus Christ with his people. Verse 17, notice this, and this is what I just described. And I did this without even knowing that this verse was in the good book. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. And that was a very distinct recognition in my heart that I knew I had to do before I even knew that this passage was in the good book. I knew I could no longer hang out with them. I knew I had to come out from their midst. I knew I could no longer continue participating in the activities that we participated in. Instinctively, the Spirit of God that became alive in me gave me that knowledge. But here it is, written down for our enjoyment. Come out from their midst, the midst of unbelievers with whom you have too close of an association and fellowship that's not causing you good but harm, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, for, and I will welcome you. 18, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, chapter 7, verse 1, Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So Paul's talking to believers in Corinth, and he's saying, listen, if you've got a partnership and you're bound together with unbelievers, stop it. You don't need to do that. That's unhealthy for you spiritually. And instead, you need to come out from their midst. You need to end that close association. Have friendship evangelism with them, yes. But you're, they're not your BFF hangout partner that you're living life with, hooked up together, bound together. That's, that needs to change. And as a matter of fact, you need to get in connection with some other brothers and sisters in Christ who can do this right here, hold each other accountable. Not because you're trying to earn something, but because it's what God has done. I will dwell in them. God's presence, His Spirit becomes in us. We become the temple of the living God. And He says, and I will walk among them. That's why we are to be separate right here. Be separate. And we are those who are perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? That's what we need to be doing. That's why Christian community is so important. That's why the church of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential for believers. We need to stop dating the church. We need to get connected to a church relationally in deep relationships so that we can have true accountability because we see that we need to be our brothers and sisters' keeper and they need to be ours in a close, bound relationship. Choose your friends wisely. If you walk with fools, harm. Walk with wise people, you're going to be wiser still. 
The testimony of the Scriptures couldn't be more plain and more clear. Amen? It just couldn't be. I left off so many passages I could go to. We could read passage after passage and just talk about them for the next hour or two. There are so many. Just read through the Proverbs. The, the Word of God is laden with this kind of truth. It's all over the place. So my challenge for you this morning, I said early on, I'm going to be challenging you to think about life groups. You need, to be in a, you need to be in a context with other people that can help you grow relationally. Husbands and wives, you do that with each other. And with your children, you're discipling them. You're, you're in a tight, intimate relationship of growth, spiritual growth. And sometimes you speak hard things to each other and sparks fly because iron sharpens iron. But within the broader context of the community of Christ, we need each other desperately in these ways as well. And I just want to encourage you and challenge you to think about that relative to your life. Are you kind of skipping through the tulips? Just, you know, that maverick Christian, I'm just out there, I'm just, I'm just out there, but you're not really relationally connected with anybody with whom you have true accountability, who knows your life, and when you have a burden, they can, they, they can help carry your burden. Or when you fall into sin, they can lovingly come alongside you and say, hey, brother, I'm here to help you, or hey, sister, we're here to help you walk through this and get you back to walking after Christ. These things are so intimate, but they're so necessary and needed. Let's not be afraid to push in to one another. Amen? Now listen, listen. I'm talking to people about God's Word and God's truth that has application for true believers in Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ, some of this may seem like, man, that's overkill. That's crazy. Are they out of their mind? Why would they even consider doing such things? That's ridiculous. Killjoys. And that's exactly what I thought whenever I grew up in the church I went to. Every time I heard about biblical principles, all I could ever think of was killjoys. All they want to do is kill my joy. I was a hedonist at heart, and they want to kill my joy. And I had no idea that actually it wasn't to kill my joy. It was to give me fullness of life. I didn't know how to distinguish between those two because my spiritual eyes hadn't been opened. But if you're here this morning, and that might be you, and you sense that your spiritual eyes are opening... Please, come talk with me, because it's the Spirit of God that does that work. And I'll be glad to walk you through the gospel, show you what it looks like coming to fellowship with Christ and with His body, and we'll get you plugged in, I guarantee you. Let's pray together.